Bristow's Right Royal Roundup. There we go. There I am. And uh, nice to talk, as always, to the wonderful Talk Royal commentator, Rupert Bell, this morning. Morning to you, Rupert. Morning, Chris Hope. Nice to talk to you this morning, as always. And uh, lots in the newspapers this morning, actually, uh, uh, about some of the royals. Let's start by talking about, apparently, uh, Boris Johnson in his memoirs. He claims that he was asked to persuade Prince Harry to stay in the UK. He said that he spoke to the Duke of Sussex for 20 minutes. He said it was a manly pep talk. I would have thought he only gets those from Meghan. And the prince still decided to move his family to North America. I mean, maybe it was the conversation with Boris that sent Harry over the edge. But what do you think of that? Well, I can see there probably might have been some constitutional reason for doing it, as he is the, was the prime minister at the time, to try and um, prevent him splitting from the royal family from a constitutional point of view. And probably during that 20 minutes, discovered that Harry wasn't for turning. Um, and then off he was going to go. But I suppose everyone was trying to somehow make sure that uh, Harry was making this for all the right reasons. Um, in, in Well, Harry obviously feels he's made it for all the right reasons. But from a constitutional point of view, um, Boris stepping in last minute, well, um, eccentric though that may seem, but actually from a practical point of view, I don't see that as a total surprise at all, because I'm sure the, the whole royal family, the institution, and indeed probably uh, within the sort of wheels of government, were probably disappointed that he felt he had to take this course of action. And, um, uh, and Boris stepping up to the plate, uh, nothing really surprising about that. But as you say, uh, it may have been the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, we're just hearing this morning and this is just being filed in the last uh, uh, half an hour or so so you may not be aware of it but the mail are reporting now that harry and megan's charity archwell was gifted two grants of more than six million dollars over the last two years but both are missing from the charity's latest tax return. Uh, the discovery has prompted speculation over what has happened to these missing millions. It's understood Archwell believes its records um, only declared the $2 million are correct. Mail Online are reporting they can confirm it's legal and possible that the money will appear on the next return. They're also saying it couldn't have happened at the worst time because it was only given the green light to spend and raise money again earlier this year after charity officials branded it delinquent and not in good standing. Now, Archwell, of course, has had controversy before when it came to some of the statements that it's put out, not financial ones, but statements it's put out where it's perhaps taken credit for projects that it wasn't directly involved in. I think at one point it took credit for some of the vaccine rollout for COVID, which it didn't really have anything to do with. Let's not also forget Prince Harry's controversy as patron of uh, a charity that has had all sorts of impropriety when it comes to some of the behaviours uh, of the, uh, 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 the the charities that he's been a patron of as well. So this is not going to be welcome news, is it? Well, all negative publicity is not helpful for Meghan and Harry as they try and rebuild their life. They've got to make sure they look squeaky clean. Now, I don't know enough. I haven't read it, so I can't uh, give a full commentary on it, but it, there does seem to be a, a chapter of a sort of events here that sort of cloud judgment, grey areas, I think is probably the best way of describing it. And let's hope there isn't something untoward, but it wouldn't be a good look if there, it was. And, but really, that should make sure that their accounting is absolutely squeaky clean at all times, because you know whether they like it or not, there will be spot, a spotlight on them and the way they're going about, <coughs> excuse me, about going about a business. So I think um, whatever, it's clearly something that's going to give the Archwell people a little bit of a headache to make sure they get the picture absolutely right and that there is no impropriety. And I think that there are two issues here, actually, regarding these sorts of stories. One is their turnover of staff. Because when you have a, 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 a regular turnover of staff at really short intervals, things get missed, inevitably, in any organisation. I mean, I have a bit of sympathy for them with that. Of course, 
Some people might say that the turnover of staff is because they're not particularly nice to work for, but that's going to cause issues. But secondly, is this not an example once again? Um, we've seen it when it came to some of their royal tours, where they've ended up perhaps taking finance for some of the security from some rather dodgy and, and dubious figures, that not being within the royal fold, but carrying out royal things like being involved in charity, going on royal tours, when you haven't got the due diligence done by being part of the royal machine, that's going to lead to these sorts of things potentially happening. And, and I think that's one of the problems. The, the safety net of the royal family um, is huge, and there's sort of checks and balances within to make sure that everything is done properly. And maybe, as you say, the high turnover of staff is something that, that then is a big problem for them, not just in Archville, but full stop. And that, as a result, can cause problems. And they need to make sure that everyone's got their eye on the ball because maybe Megan's quite difficult to work for. There's a good deal of pressure to get everything, <coughs> excuse me, everything 100% right. And that is a big concern for them going forward for the, for the Archwell team. How can they make sure they are seen to be doing everything right? But if you've got a high turnover of staff, you need loyalty at all times from your staff. Now, we always, firms, people move on all the time. But it just does seem to me, in this case, the uh, um, human drain is, is enormous in, in, and so the, the churn within Archwell does not help their cause. But let's hope that there is nothing untoward in this, because if it is, then that's going to add further sort of problems for the Harry and Meghan uh, machine going forward. Uh, one final story around them this morning and the Harry and Meghan machine. Many people are apparently saying that this new documentary um, I didn't realise this, but it's about polo. It's five parts, which is, I don't know, is there that much to say about polo? And apparently, um, Nacho Figueras, who is the Argentinian player, who is a friend of Prince Harry, that is the main focus of the documentary. The Netflix bosses are saying, and bearing in mind their deal with Netflix, for which they were paid millions, is coming to an end. The Netflix bosses are apparently saying, well, hang on, where's Harry in this? He's barely featuring at all. How can we have a five-part documentary on Polo featuring Prince Harry that doesn't feature Prince Harry? Um, this is the problem. I'd, if it's just about this guy who does like to be the centre of attention, there's no two ways about it. Um, he is... You know, he, he is someone who is not frightened of a bit of publicity uh, and attention seeking. But for Polo, to, for it to be a good documentary, yes, it should feature Harry. But of course, he doesn't want to be featured. So but actually, what's going to be the story? Is it just going to be how this sort of playboy figure within uh, American Polo circles conducts his business? Well, it's not going to draw many viewers unless it's got, you know, we've got uh, obviously the new uh, Jilly Cooper novel coming out. That, you know, polo world can often be a bit like what goes on in the in, in, in a Jilly Cooper novel. Well, that would be, probably might be actually far more entertaining um, and actually give our viewers something to get their teeth into, the sort of real Hollywood polo lives. You know, that is what probably people will want to see. But if it's just a bit of a puff for, for Matt Nacho and his cronies, and for five parts, my goodness me, I, I mean, I've covered polo. Um, it's an entertaining, it, it, it's a pretty difficult sport to watch when you watch it live. No one really knows what's going on. They're basically going on there to have a nice uh, cocktail in, in sunny conditions because half the people haven't got a clue what's happening, but they just think they should be there. That's what polo does attract, even in this country. It's a highly skilled sport, but in real terms, this ain't going to move the Netflix dial at all. I'm absolutely convinced. Prove me wrong. Happy days. Nacho, if you've got a really good story, then it justifies five parts and kick on. But uh, five I'm not... Hours. Like, five hours of polo. I mean, my word, honestly, I, I don't know whether... I mean, I'm feeling exhausted already, Rupert.